G'day, I'm Ash. I hope you're all doing fantastically well. And this is the Goodyear Super Corsair. Basically, F2G is the designation for the aircraft. It was supposed to be a carrier-based aircraft for the United States Navy and, well, ended up being a pretty famous air racer, which is utterly fantastic to think. Although a lot of warbirds ended up in that kind of category at the end of the war. You know, 1945 being sold a surplus, what else do you do with your time? You know, Red Bull Air Racing, of course. Now, there were three different variants. There was a XF2G, which a prototype was one converted from a standard FG-1 uh, Corsair. There was another one, which was a land-based variant, which was the G1, with 418 were ordered, five were built, and the order was cancelled. And then there was the F2G, which is a carrier-based variant, which 10 ordered, and they built five, and the order was cancelled. There's one aircraft today that's still on display at the Museum of Flight in Seattle, Washington. And there is the Airworthy F2G1, which is basically known as Race 57. She's an air racer and has an extensive history on its own with the Reno Air Racers. And it was featured in the movie Thunder Over Reno, and the aircraft was brought in, in February 2017 by Stuart Walton and is based out of uh, Bentonville, Arkansas. Now, it was intended as a low altitude interceptor equipped with a 28 cylinder radial, but Again, I don't think it really would serve this role particularly effective. The massive honker of an engine actually does well, decrease visibility. However, they did put a new all-round vision bubble type canopy on the top, so it looks kind of off. You have a look at the side profile. There's a bunch of aircraft that we're going to go have a look at now. And I just think that this thing is rather interesting in itself. Right, here it is, just looking just briefly. There's two tiny Tims strapped to the bottom of it. I will be using those during the mission, but as you can see, I'm just sort of checking out the cockpit here. It just looks really strange. For a Corsair, you expect the gull wings, which it has, but not the exact long nose that this particular aircraft has either. I'd be curious to know what the actual armament is. So, glossing over the Wikipedia page, it does say that this thing is equipped with 450 caliber 12.7 M2 machine guns with 400 rounds of gun. That makes sense, considering there is 1,800 rounds there. Uh, there are rocket provisions for rockets, as you can see, got the tiny Tims underneath, and it does say up to 1,600 pounds or 725 kilograms worth of bombs. But again, interesting stuff. And the max power plant, well, it's a Wasp Major 28-cylinder radial engine with 3,000 horsepower or 2,200 kilowatts. As you can see here, we're coming in to engage these J6Ks, and this is sort of the first test you get with, I guess, playing the vehicle in an intercept role. The guns are a little bit fiddly, but my gun tightening distance is way the hell off as one of my AIs launches a, uh, a tiny Tim. As you can see, it's just clean up duty down here. This is basically what the whole entire mission is about. Now, Dynamic Campaign is, is a weird sort of staged base, a uh, place where you can do and complete certain objectives to win a, a campaign or a war. I have no idea where that tiny Tim went. I fired the other one too late and that they've just gone. Oh well, we're not necessarily going to get those back. We'll just stick to our good old guns, hey? Now, interesting, uh, Wikipedia lists this aircraft of comparable role, or configuration and error, at the top of the list is the CAC-15. Hmm, could I get the uh, CA-15 Kangaroo, please? Or the Curtis XP-62, uh, which is a prototype single-engine uh, interceptor aircraft, which looks absolutely chonky. But again, I'll put pictures up of these in the video, you'll be able to see them. Now, we do know that this thing sits at a battle rating of 6.7, and it can be attained in the battle pass way of life. However, that being said, it's, well, it's going to be an interesting one to get and achieve, considering you have to be such a high level in order to get it. I doubt there'll be many people that have access to this particular aircraft, at least initially. Being that it is the free vehicle that you get from participating in the battle pass without having to purchase one, I suppose that's what you get uh, in, in hindsight. As you can see, the guns are quite nice and the new sparkle effect's all right, but I do find that these guns do spark a little bit, especially on certain wing surfaces. So you can see I've got a hit there. There we go, knocked out the pilot. And this is just what we're doing. We're just cleaning up J6s. I'm sort of testing this aircraft, you know, maneuverability here. I think the engine adds quite a bit of weight. And there's one out of ammo. Oh no. But anyway, this, the engine development for the Corsairs is quite interesting because obviously there's so many different versions of the Corsair. Again, Im an improvised low altitude version of the classic uh, F4U Corsair, the Navy fighter the US Navy used. And obviously this engine is particularly interesting because it, with the, the Wasp Major, the 28 cylinder, 
it's the same engine that was used on the Hughes H4 Hercules, the B-50 Super Fortress, the strategic bomber, and the B-36. So adding this in game, does that mean we're going to get a B-36 and B-50 later on? I, I highly doubt it. Strategic Bombers and War Thunder is another subject and another video that I'd like to talk about altogether, because obviously we're heading in that direction. And with the advent of the new devlog the other day where we get the A7, hmm, it's going to be particularly interesting to see. Now, what I would like to have happen is that Garjan implement the skins for this thing. It'd be good if the you know, content creators or somebody can actually make some usable skins that could be put up on the marketplace you know, to, to, to celebrate the fact that this is an air racing aircraft, just like the Sea Fury and, and so many other warbirds of that comparable era. It'd be a nice nod to the air racing history this particular vehicle is most famous for. Now, the production of the F2G has a teardrop canopy in place of the original Corsair cockpit, and it is similar to that of the P47's cockpit. Uh, the other standard and thing to note here is the vertical stabilizer of the F2G is 12 inches taller than on the standard Corsair, and has an auxiliary rudder to counteract the massive engine torque that this monster has. The rate of climb was such that it actually outclimbed most jet fighters of that compatible time, and with a rate of you know, 7,000 feet per minute, which was twice the rate of climb of a standard Corsair, I think this would be an interesting vehicle. Now, it doesn't necessarily climb particularly well. From testing in this particular mission and replaying it a few times, I don't think it does. I don't think it suits that particular play style. I think it's a good aircraft, don't get me wrong, but I don't think it's represented well enough in War Thunder at current time. Unfortunately for the development of the actual aircraft IRL, by the end of the war in August 1945, only five of the aircraft were ever completed, and both models revealed, you know, in testing, deficiency in lateral control and insufficient speed, which were basically bars for further development in what Corsair and, and Goodyear would actually like to do. In addition, the F-8 Bearcat basically promised more than what the F-2G could do, while still powered with the original Corsair's double wasp power plant, which was already in production, making the F2G really redundant. You know, thus further production of the F2G was really cancelled, and it is quite, the, you know, a sad thing to say. Now, the internal fuel capacity was increased greatly over the F2G1, and all provisions were provided to carry two droppable external tanks, but the Navy wasn't happy with that either, as, as, as a proposed alternative. So yes, this is probably a good way to introduce a vehicle to War Thunder. Although the battle power system, regardless of how you take it, you're positive or negative, this thing is stage, I think it's like stage 50 or something along those lines. Hold on, let me just double check for you. It, it is incredibly high up there, I know that much, considering the Matilda is at stage 4, uh, the boat is at stage 38. Yeah, it is stage 50. And as far as all we know is it's 6.7 and ultra rare, but then again, who knows? And apparently we can sell them on the marketplace too later on. Great, that's another thing that we have to worry about. Hurrah. But apparently this thing is featured in World of Warplanes as well, so you can get that one. Uh, if you care about World of Warplanes, I certainly don't. It also appears in the game Aces of the Pacific 1946, and was basically designed as the premier fast kamikaze interceptor. Its greatest asset was incredible climb and rate, which allowed the 30,000 feet in 4 minutes, according to that particular video game at least. Looking around, there seems to be uh, several other vehicles, video games, which this thing is a part of, but it's nice to see this thing in War Thunder, at least, as a nod to, I guess, its history. But proking a bit back at the Battle Pass system, I've just discovered that there is <laughs> the race camouflage in the files. You do get it at a later reward stage down the line. In fact, it's for number 54, which is free. It's basically a racing camouflage for the F2G-1. So I guess I just ate my own words. I... Again, it's an interesting and novel aircraft. I don't see that it'd be particularly useful, even at 6.7. The Bearcat would be infinitely better, and even then you... I don't see very many Bearcats out and about anymore. It's not like the old days where super prop fighters were the way to go. You know, Griffin Spitz, your Furies, your, your F-8Fs, you know, your Kai 100s, etc, etc. But it is what it is. The old days are gone now. It's now filled with premium exclusive aircraft like, you know, Harriers and F-89s and so on and so forth but I guess you know playing the game for a really long time you see a change in development regardless of that's good or bad I don't necessarily know I wouldn't be able to tell you but I've been playing this game for a very bloody long time it's nice to see another edition 
even if it is under a battle pass system. But that's just my opinion. All right, my name is Ash. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Cheerio.